All right, folks, we're going to wait for a few more people to come in and then we're going to kick off. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Dublin of the Future, What's Possible, ha hosted by Trinity College. Uh, I'm Hazel Chu. I'm your, um, the Lord Mayor and also Chair of today's session. There are going to be some really interesting uh, speakers coming uh, our way tonight, and I'm delighted to have them um, speaking on what the future of Dublin looks like. We have Deputy Lord Mayor of Paris, uh, Deputy Mayor of Paris Professor Christoph Nojowski. I'm sure he'll give out to me for pronouncing his name wrong. I will have uh, Professor Brian Caulfield, um, Miss Lauren uh, uh, Twight, and I will then have questions and answers. I'm going to give a bit about the bios of each person before they speak, um, but I just want to thank everyone for coming on board to this session um, of the Dublin of the future. We are in development plan stage in Dublin City Council at the moment, and we're going to be chairing um, a series of the motions that have come our way. I want to say a massive thank you to you all for submitting your motions. We and um, a big thank you to the councillors as well. We have over a thousand motions uh, this uh, time round, which is apparently I've been told three or, or times more than previous uh, times. And all those sessions will be chaired in the evenings over the course of the next week by myself and by the Deputy Lord Mayor. And from there, we will agree on what the next iteration looks like in terms of the de development plan. I myself would love to see more pedestrianization across the board. We have an uptake in cycling highest of um, our time, and we want to make sure we provide sustainable transport across the board. We have a good minister who uh, would be funding all of these endeavors and eager to, so I would love to see this happen. I would love to provide a sustainable, safe and healthy future for the next generation, for my own daughter and for others. And I think we can do that. And I think through the last couple of weeks when you see uh, people sitting outside and enjoying themselves in the sunshine, that Dublin can become that city. Uh, but that is with your help and others. So I'm going to launch right into uh, this session, which I think you all will find very interesting. As I said, I have the uh, Deputy Mayor of Paris, uh, Professor Christoph Najowski. Uh, he was appointed Deputy Mayor of Paris with responsibility for regreening of public space green spaces, biodiversity and animal welfare in 2020. Before that, he was deputy mayor of Paris with responsibility for transport, transportation and public space from 2014 to 2020, where his work focused on reducing air pollution and greenhouse gases, uh, promoting better mobility for everyone, regardless of age or social background, reconnecting Paris with the Seine River and Paris numerous canals, uh, can, can't wait to hear about that part, restoring public space for pedestrians and cyclists. He has also been president of the European Cyclist, um, Cyclist Federation since 2018. Uh, that will be followed by, he will be followed by Professor Brian Corfield, who from Trinity College Dublin is an associate professor in Department of Civil, Structural and Environmental Engineering, Trinity College Dublin. His research assesses global issues such as the environmental impacts of transport and methods to reduce the carbon emissions emissions of transport. And then we will have Miss Lauren Twait. Twait. She's going to give out to me as well for pronouncing her name wrong. So it's the principal D8 development, a social enterprise that leases and renovates, renovates vacant properties from community use. She has a very um, academic, professional and activist background and has worked on community and regional projects um, in California, Galway, and Inchicore. Lauren is passionate about active travel and the opportun opportunities it provides for livable cities, public health, and averting climate catastrophe. She is an MSc candidate in sustainable transport and mobility in TU Dublin. And I guess just on a personal note, Lauren is a friend of ours, a friend of myself and Patrick's, and has been instrumental in trying to rebuild and uh, reshape Inchicore and surrounding areas. Uh, I love her dearly, so and I'm delighted to be able to introduce her for this panel. So I will kick off with our Deputy Mayor of Paris. Christophe, you're going to pronounce your name for me while you're, while you're also kicking off. You have 10 minutes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation. I'm very pleased and very honored to be with you here today. So I have a, a small presentation uh, uh, for my speech. Um, 
how to make our cities more livable and how we try in Paris also to face that uh, and to cope with uh, climate change and also uh, the questions of uh, biodiversity. Um, next, uh, please. Uh, we have a, a strong responsibility uh, for climate change and also for biodiversity crisis. Uh, the cities have a strong impact uh, about uh, uh, the global uh, resource cons consumption. You can see that uh, they are hosting 50% of human population, but that, that they are responsible for 70% of the global resource consumption. So uh, the local communities uh, have the power to act and they must use it. Uh, they also have the duty uh, to get uh, all urban actors on board. And in this sense, uh, the city of Paris uh, intends to fully play its role of facilitator and mediator uh, towards association, corporate actors and citizens. So we are trying also to uh, uh, to, to face this, uh, these questions by several measures. The first one is transforming the city by greening it. So we can go to the next slide, please. And the next, oh, thank you. So greening the city uh, involves major projects uh, to transform public spaces, uh, such as the famous uh, Champs-Élysées. Uh, this project will lead uh, to a huge uh, transformation by uh, 2030. Uh, some uh, uh, 360 trees will be uh, planted on the Place de la Concorde uh, with the aim of revegetating uh, the area and creating uh, shaded and more breathable uh, areas with the spaces uh, reserved for cars should be halved uh, to mitigate uh, the nuisance uh, caused by the, the heavy traffic. Uh, we are trying also with the next uh, slide, uh, if we can see that, please. Uh, yes, we are experiencing also uh, uh, this, uh, this future measure. So here you can have some uh, pictures of uh, some pedestrianization of the Champs-Élysées that we already made uh, during the car free day, for example, or that we are also experiencing now once a month, of course, during the pandemic, we had, uh, we couldn't uh, experience uh, the same thing, but uh, now we are trying uh, once again, uh, the first Sunday of July, we will have uh, a pedestrianization of the Champs-Élysées once again. And I hope that uh, people will uh, also enjoy uh, the possibility to, uh, to just uh, enjoy the, the place uh, and uh, have the, this uh, beautiful uh, avenue without uh, uh, the cars. We have uh, the next please, yes. We have also, uh, we are trying to develop nature, to develop the vegetation in the city. We have set ourselves a goal of planting 100 hectares uh, uh, in uh, the public spaces. That means outside of parks and gardens. And to achieve this, uh, I have a watchword that I hammer uh, home every day, priority to the open ground whether it's planting trees, uh, create, creating uh, window boxes or green walls, we are going after the open ground wherever uh, it's possible. And thus 170,000 trees, that means the number of births that we will have uh, in six years in Paris, that means one tree for one birth. Uh, and it will be also a, a beautiful symbol we think uh, to have more trees uh, in the cities and they will be planted by 2026. Uh, that means in five years uh, in, uh, in, in the city. So we will try to do that in the, in the gardens, in the woods, but also in the streets over uh, the public space, uh, like we did, for example, uh, 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 in the embankments of uh, the Paris Ring Road uh, 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 already. We have also, next please, uh, we have also the ambitious uh, of uh, uh, greening the streets. So you can see some examples of uh, what we can do and what we aim to do with planting trees uh, over the streets. Uh, we are removing uh, the car lanes and planting trees, letting also, uh, it, it is obvious, uh, the place and the space uh, for deliveries, but uh, we, uh, we, we want 
to give back the space to the nature that was taken by the cars. So see, you can have some examples next uh, uh, also. This is an example of a, of a short street where we can plant also the, the, the trees in the center of the street. That means that uh, the, the, the tree and the vegetation has a social role also to, to gather uh, people uh, around uh, the vegetation and also to have a social life uh, instead of having just uh, parking for cars. Uh, next slide, please. If we can go to the next slide. No, we can't. Is there a problem with the... Okay. So we also have ambitious uh, of reading the, bu the buildings. Uh, the goal is to reach uh, 100. So here are some other examples where we can also extend a garden, uh, plant uh, a forest uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a roundabout uh, instead of having just uh, 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 this roundabout and the, with the traffic around, we, we have a, a, a project of uh, an urban forest in the Place de Catalogne. We have also uh, different projects uh, on the next slide, if we can go also to, uh, to the next slide. Uh, yes, that means now gr uh, greening the buildings. So the goal that we have is to reach 150 hectares of green buildings by 2026 and to green 200 additional roofs uh, of municipal facilities while promoting ur urban agricultural uh, projects also. We have also to rethink the, the mobility, so we can go also to the, to the next slide. Uh, that means going towards a pedestrian and to uh, a, a walkable and uh, bikeable city. Uh, with, during the pandemic, we had 60% uh, of increase uh, in, the, in the use of bikes and also 80% uh, in the third quarter of, of 2020 compared to 2019. It's uh, huge. And we already did some, uh, uh, some projects with uh, these uh, uh, pop-up bike lanes you can see here on the Rue de Rivoli, uh, which is now uh, just a, a street for uh, pedestrians, for uh, bikers, and also for um, for buses and taxis. But we don't have any more uh, traffic on this street, and we have a very, uh, a very uh, up, in, uh, very uh, big increase uh, in the in the use of uh, of the of the of the cycling. Uh, you have also some other is illustrations of the policy we made uh, in Paris in these uh, five last years, removing one car lane traffic and give it, giving it uh, to uh, the cyclists. That means having the good uh, network and also the good facilities to people to be uh, safe on a, on a separate and a continue a network of bike lanes, and then you have the conditions to have people uh, on their bikes. Another example is uh, on the fact that we uh, built uh, um, uh, a bike lane on the Champs Elysees. It's the first step of the pedestrian pedestrianization that we want for uh, uh, 2030. And another example, the third one on the Rue de Rivoli, which was just a, a, a street for cars, and then uh, the first step was uh, having this uh, bike lane. And then the second step was to have the central car lane that was also removed and given to a pop-up bike lane. So uh, if you are looking at the situation of Rue Triboli just uh, three or four years ago, it was a very busy street with just uh, motorized traffic. And now we have just the traffic of buses, taxis, uh, pedestrians and cyclists. That, that is uh, a huge uh, change, but people uh, supported us also in this transformation. Another example is also the, the fact that we changed the highway, uh, which was uh, uh, on the left bank and the right bank of, of the River Seine. Uh, we removed it and uh, uh, be, instead of having uh, uh, 4,000 uh, cars by day, uh, we pedestrianized it uh, in 2016, and now we have uh, uh, a space given to pedestrians and to cyclists. And uh, 
with a support of maybe uh, two thirds of the inhabitants and the, the citizens uh, for that pedestrianization. So these are some examples of our uh, citywide objectives to combine cycling and greening in order to create uh, 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 another paradigm, also a shift paradigm to about, uh, about the affectation of public space. That, that means giving first the priority to pedestrians and then uh, uh, at last uh, for private uh, motor vehicles. If we can go uh, further, please. That means also working on biodiversity. We, no, we must not forget also that we have some uh, uh, bad uh, also uh, changes in uh, biodiversity. For instance, we've lost 75% of Parisian uh, sparrows for the latest decade. And to preserve our, our biodiversity and fight uh, its erosion, we must first work on exemplary management of our natural spaces. Uh, that's what uh, we did with the fact that uh, we are strongly committed against uh, phytosanitary products, for example, uh, to, uh, to have a, a better biodiversity in our city. We can go next, please, to go uh, fast, faster. And uh, we are, all, yes, we are also trying to, um, uh, to make that uh, uh, every people, every citizen contribute also to our effort. So we, uh, we, we want and we make uh, every willing citizen a committed player for biodiversity and vegetation. We offer them, for example, several tools to help, to help them uh, make a difference. We have 20,000 citizens that have already volunteered through our pla platform, Paris platform. And uh, uh, for example, they can uh, uh, care about uh, injured uh, wild animals uh, that are found on the Parisian territory to, and give them to a, to a health center. But Parisians can also play a key role in making the, uh, the, the city greener. For example, we have the greening permit. Uh, it's a, an authorization uh, to temporarily occupy the public domain, granted for a renewable period of uh, three years uh, to a person or a group uh, wishing to garden a small space of the municipal, municipal uh, street network. And we have already 3,000 uh, valid permits and 2,000 of them for three stands. And uh, we have a uh, uh, participation uh, of people who are uh, uh, giving uh, more place to nature uh, in the streets uh, uh, near their, their home. We also have uh, 150 shared gardens uh, open to the publics. So collectives and associations uh, have uh, uh, expectations and are increasingly interested in gardening in the city. So they are, uh, they are uh, enabled also to, to contribute to uh, greening the public spaces. So the next slide is an invitation to come to Paris. This was five years ago, uh, an express highway in the center of the city and now it's a place for people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christoph. I just texted my manager, city manager there to say, is it okay if we hire you uh, to come to Dublin? So uh, to say I'm not jealous is, is kind of an understatement of the century. That was amazing. And it will be uh, incredible if we could uh, achieve all that you have over in Paris or a fraction of it will be good. I'm gonna ask everyone to put the uh, questions in their question box. I'm gonna be asking them of our speakers after all the speakers have spoken. So at the end, uh, after Lauren's um, uh, talk, we will have 20 minutes of Q&A. So please put, put in uh, your questions at the bottom in the question box. If you have a specific person you wanna direct it to, please let me know. Otherwise I'll be asking all the attendees, uh, all the speakers. Uh, next up we have Professor Brian Caulfield. Brian. Okay, um, can you hear me and see the slides? Excellent, okay, thank you very much um, uh, Lord Mayor um, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the presentation today from on behalf of Trinity and it would have been fantastic to have this type of event obviously on campus but that's not possible at the moment. Um, my talk is called Dublin by Numbers. Um, I'm going to talk about what traffic we have in this city, how we can can we do what the, 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 the amazing things that we've just seen um, in Paris? So the first slide here, if it'll move for me. So this is a, this is a slide I've stolen from our Provost elect. Um, it was part of the campaign for Provost and it's um, 
a network of all of the different places that are connected to our campus, um, our, our main uh, college green campus. And I suppose part of the, the, the talk today is around this idea of a 15 minute city, the super blocks as well that are happening in Paris and also the amazing stuff that's happening, um, uh, sorry, super blocks in Barcelona and the amazing stuff that's happening in Paris. But during the campaign, our provost, um, our provost elect, she asked us to consider this, you know, how we're connected and where we're connected across the campus. And Trinity is a very big stakeholder um, within, the, within the city. And with Martina Mullen for, from Healthy Trinity, we have been engaging with the city council, with the Lord Mayor's office, et cetera, to do what we can do and what we can give back to the city um, a, a, as a university. And also we're one of the, the biggest trip attractors in, in the city center. More people come to our campus um, than, than any other campus uh, in the city center. So I said it was, it was Dublin by numbers, but this is a global number and everybody probably realizes what I'm gonna say next. Um, 51%, that's what we have to cut our emissions in transport by in eight and a half years. And this is phenomenal amount of uh, um, carbon to take out of uh, our transport network. Um, it needs all shoulders to the wheel. It needs everybody that's on this call um, uh, being active um, in, in trying to change policy making and doing what they can to, to, to influence how our city and how the rest of our country um, is, uh, is run in terms of transport. So this is, this is obviously Dublin and one of our many bridges. Um, so in Dublin, it rains 111 days a year. Um, in Paris, it rains 113 days a year. So Dublin, um, uh, Christoph, is a sunnier city um, and you're more than welcome to come visit us as well. But the, the purpose of this is the, the, the naysayers around why are we giving up all of this space to, to active modes of transport or other modes of transport will say it's too wet, et cetera. Um, it's not the case. Dublin's also a very flat city as well. So this data comes from the um, Corden counts from, 20 to 2000, from 2006 to 2019. Um, I didn't put up 2020 because the, the, the data falls off, uh, off the scale. Um, but basically it shows how we cross our, our canals to get into the city centre. And there you can see the public transport uh, numbers um, just above 100,000 and going up to 120,000. You'll obviously see a dip there when it when it when the recession um, started. These are our walk numbers. Again, um, they're steadily increasing, and they're even more um, uh, within the city uh, the city centre itself. Um, these are our cycling numbers. Again, they are increasing. This is I know our cycling percentage is much higher than the one I'm going to show you, but this is a snapshot in time every November, and it goes back. Um, there's a nice time series of this data, so you can see trends, and that's why I want to show it to you. So then the next one is the private car. And as you can see here, the private car has fallen from 2006 to 2019. And we're getting somewhere with, with, with people no longer coming into the city center by private car. So we started off with a public transport mode share of 51% and a car mode share of 38, 9% for, um, for, for, for walking and then 2% for cycling. So where were we in 2019? You can see that the car has fallen off, 11% uh, decrease in the numbers driving into the canal coordin when this data was collected. You can see everything else is up, public transport, walking and cycling, all of these are up. So looking at that slide and you can see the numbers of people that are driving in um, and you look at the, kind of the physical built environment within the city centre, within the canals, um, there is much more than 27% of the city given over to the car. Um, than there is when you look at all the other modes of transport. And that's one of the things I think that we, we, we should start to consider. Slide. So this is a slide I use quite a bit. I, I, and I always say this to my students as well, um, that in transport, we have a space problem. Uh, we don't have a transport problem. In Dublin especially, we don't have the space for everybody to take cars into the city centre. So we have to use collective modes of transport, um, then also walking and cycling. There's another one of these that, that has uh, cycling as well, and you see the same kind of dramatic change. So why do, we continue, why do we continually give up this much space to the car and allow the car this much access when it's the decreasing mode of transport, it's the, it's the one we're using the least to, to, to come into our city. This is another number, and I did a bit of research on this during the week, um, and it's very back of an envelope calculation. So all of these P's across the city are our car parks. 
very lucrative car parking spaces that we have in our city. Yes, Trinity has car parking. Yes, Leinster has this car parking. And yes, there's a lot of public sector car parking, but these are the private car parking spaces. I did a quick tally on it, and I think I worked it out that we would get about 1,090 square meter um, uh, apartments, two bedroom square apartments, if we were to take this type of parking out. And as the car becomes less prominent, um, there will always be you know, need for car, need for people to come into the city in car, but as that becomes less prominent, maybe that's one of the solutions um, um, for, for this amount of uh, um, car parking that we have in our city. 142 million, so 142 million, that's the number of people that took Dublin bus in 2019. And this is the key to get to where we want to be, to say where Paris is. This public transport in Dublin bus is the workhorse of the city. 30% of people that travel into our city do so by bus. And there's no getting around that. Um, and buses take up a lot of space. And our buses, um, are they, they take up an awful lot of space in our city centre. And how do we get around them? Um, there's definitely modelling that's been done around College Green and giving back College Green to the city. And as I often joke with the city manager, an extension of Front Square, wouldn't it be lovely to go all the way down as far as um, uh, the, the, the central bank building? Um, but the, these buses can't just disappear because they're carrying people and they're carrying people into the city. So we, we need to come up with solutions around that as well. And this is one of the, the, the key things that we need to get around to get to where they are in Paris, 0%. Um, pedantic people might argue that there is a small number of people that, 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 that do travel underground in the city, but there's 0% of people travel underground in our city. Um, there's a small tunnel under the Phoenix Park, but through the city centre, through where we want to pedestrianise, through O'Connell Street, through um, around Dame Street, et cetera, that's where all the buses are. And we need to try and get a percentage of this underground. And that's what's being done as, as part of the, um, the Department of Transport and the NTA and TAI's plan for um, the Metrolink, um, which is outside of the current review of the, the GDA strategy. And this is an artist's impression of the Tara Street station. So what it will look like um, when it is built, hopefully soon. So then, into the future, I've only got a couple of more slides here. Um, into the future, 50 million people, that's the number of people that um, uh, the, the Metro will be able to take on a daily basis, uh, sorry, on a yearly basis. That's the number of people that will be able to, we'll be able to take off our streets, that then we will maybe be able to free up the bus space that's, uh, that's currently in the city centre and give it back to the people. Minus 10,000, so this is another project. That's the number of car trips they expect to be taken away by building just four extra stops on the Green Lewis line when it's extended to Finglas. So it's all about making these, which, which may seem small incremental changes in the number of car trips that happen on, on a daily basis in the city um, and putting them onto public transport, active modes preferably, um, and getting them off the streets. Um, and a lot of people kind of go, you're anti-car, you're anti-car. Um, but, you know, it's okay to be anti-car. You know, they, they, they clog up our cities, they pollute, they cause cancer, they cause all a, a number of things around economic costs of congestion, et cetera. So it is okay, you know, to say, well, the people have voted with their feet, you know, there's 11% drop in the number of people that are coming into the city by, by car. So then I've just got a few final points. Um, we need to reallocate our space to people and not vehicles. People move through our city, not vehicles. Um, and we need to do that in the most um, economic of space, but also in terms of emissions as possible. 51% in eight and a half years uh, is such a high target and it has to happen and it has to happen soon. The delivery of large scale public transport projects, they also have to happen. There's, there's no getting around that. Metro has to happen. The Lewis extensions will also have to happen. Dark Plus, et cetera. All of these will enable people to get into the city um, not using a car and to use efficient public transport. Road user pricing, and there's no way we can get around this. When we build this public transport and we're spending billions on these public transport projects, we will have to charge people that want to come into the city still in a car. And that will be on whatever scale is decided. But 
when you look at the most successful cities in the world, this is what they do. You've got the carrot in terms of the public transport projects, but then you have to introduce road, road user pricing when people don't switch over to the, to the, the alternative modes of transport, active modes. And this is something that we've seen happen in the city um, at breakneck speed over the past uh, year through the pandemic. And, you know, never waste a good crisis. I suppose it's kind of almost the motto of Dublin City Council at the moment. The work that they've done in the city is absolutely phenomenal and we should be very proud of it. Um, and we should fight to keep the space that has been reallocated to, to active modes. And then finally, my, my point here is public demand. The pe people want this. Um, it's not something, um, the majority of people, I think at least in the city and the Lord Mayor would speak better to how the citizens want and what they need, but. I think there's a huge public demand for this, and it's something that um, it's something that's seen across the world. We're very lucky to have um, um, a speaker from Paris today, but it's happening across all of the cities in the world that people want this. They want their cities back. They want to be able to live in their cities. Um, and as I started with Trinity, I'm going to finish with Trinity. And this is a picture um, of anyone that's been in around the campus. Um, this is a picture of our, our lovely wildflower lawns in the front of our front of our campus. Um, and I encourage everybody to come into it once it's safe to do so. And I will finish at that. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, yeah, your, your numbers on departments instead of car parks really kind of uh, made me think, oh my God, we need to get rid of car parks. Uh, I'm sure I'll get a, a few emails after saying that, but if we can't even pedestrianize one of our city streets at William Streets because of the car parks there, we have always had a massive problem when it comes to uh, car lobbying. And it's if it's against cars, it's against cars, but it, it, like we have to admit that, listen, we want you out of your car so you can have a healthier uh, lifestyle of living that's more sustainable through other active modes of transport. So uh, thank you for that. I am now going to, we have quite a number of questions come in. Uh, so thank you very much for all those. We will be asking them after our final speaker, Lauren Chute who is our COVID mobility expert uh, and has been part of the founder of, or actually the main founder of Dublin uh, Development D8. So thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much. Um, I will just get my slides going. Okay, I'm very humbled to be taking part in this event. Thank you so much for asking me. Um, Martina asked me to talk specifically about the work I've been doing in Inchicore to engage local people in projects like Bus Connects and COVID Mobility. But before I get into that, as this event is hosted by Trinity, I thought it would be given some of my favorite ideas from my time as a Trinity arts student. I graduated in 2008 and in my final year specialized in three areas. James Joyce's famous book, Ulysses, contemporary Irish poetry and Greek tragedy. I find these texts really useful when thinking about what is possible for the future of Dublin and why everyone needs to be involved in that effort to create a living city. Ulysses is at its most basic, a walking tour of Dublin. We follow Leopold Bloom, the modern day Odysseus as he ambles, jaunts and perambulates around the streets of Dublin from his home on Eccles Street to Westmoreland Street, the National Library to Sandymount Beach he hops a tram up to Glasnevin Cemetery and he stumbles through the red light district. No other book in the English language celebrates how profoundly social it is to go for a walk. Moving on to contemporary poetry, I love this quote from the poet Avon Boland. She said, in Irish poetry, it was easier to have a political murder as the subject of an Irish poem than a baby or a washing machine. She published her first book in the 1960s when Irish poetry was very much a man's game and good poems were about politics, violence and war. Avon was one of the first women to pry the door open on what was considered worthy subject matter for a poem. And that project of representing women <clears throat> and children in street design and urban planning has to happen now the way that it did in Irish poetry. The Dublin I want to live in is a feminist and intersectionalist city where people of all ages, abilities and genders and backgrounds feel represented and are given the space and resources to live full, productive, healthy lives. And finally, I want to think about the obscene. When I was studying Greek drama, I became obsessed with this word, translated literally from the Greek obscene or off stage, and how it connects to modern notions of what kinds of behaviour is morally repulsive, what kinds of activity is considered worthy of public display and how we have deified cars in the way the, the Greeks worshiped Zeus and Apollo and Dionysus. 
So I live in Inchicore, which is four kilometers west of the city center. And like a lot of places in Dublin, it's the site of big infrastructural projects that have gone out to public consultation in recent years. Bus Connects, St. Michael's Estate, and now Metro Southwest. When I first saw the plans for Bus Connects in Inchicore, I was horrified. The aerial view map showed a blunt road widening project that would see the removal of the few remaining mature street trees we have in the area. And this was planned to happen on roads that were already sufficiently wide to accommodate two-way private traffic, on-street parking, and the bus lanes currently in place. I had moved into the area after living in my family home in Bray, where the council had, without notice, hired contractors to fell all of the mature trees in the estate. I was at home with my four-month-old the day it happened. It was a February morning, bitterly cold, and I wrapped my baby in a blanket and stood in front of one of the trees, sobbing, while the contractors cut down 40-year-old sycamores around me. When I saw the Bus Connects plan, I was determined not to relive that trauma. So I read the plans and I came up with an alternative proposal, a compromise and presented it to my neighbors. A local artist, Jared Green, hosted a meeting in his house and a diverse group of neighbors, people living in Inchicore for generations and blow-ins like myself, got together and talked it out. We agreed to make big concessions on access for private cars measures that would make it much less convenient for us to drive around the area so that we could retain our trees and improve the experience of walking with additional pedestrian crossings. We sent in our proposal with almost 90 households signing up to that vision. Some weeks later, the NTA hosted a meeting with local residents groups and presented an alternative design that not only accepted all of our recommendations, but provided additional trees and wider footpaths for Grant Crescent. It was amazing. At that point, I had no formal training in transport or urban planning, but through community organizing, I was able to influence the design for a much better outcome. And then COVID happened. My daughter was 18 months old when the crashes closed. I attempted working from home and tag teaming childcare with my husband and almost had a nervous breakdown. After a month, I left my job as a legal researcher and became a full-time carer, spending as much time out of the house with my daughter as possible. In May 2020, DCC released a document outlining their COVID mobility strategy for Dublin and asked residents to submit requests for footpath extensions and cycle lanes. I jumped at the opportunity. The more I walked around with the buggy, the more problems I saw in the built environment. Problems that weren't going to be fixed by bus connects and that would be exacerbated by the development of St. Michael's estate. So rather than putting in piecemeal requests for infrastructure as DCC had requested, I designed a holistic network of walking and cycling for Inchicore, drawing inspiration from low traffic neighborhoods in London, the coastal mobility route in Dunleary, and the mandatory guidance for Irish planners, Deemers, the design manual for urban roads and streets. At the heart of that plan was turning the yellow box at the center of Inchicore into a new civic space. Again, I consulted with the neighbors, visited shops in the village, but because of the public health restrictions, I had to do most of that consultation work online, not in person. The feedback was initially very supportive. I got over 100 online submissions supporting the plan with less than 10% objecting. I sent the proposal to DCC and to my councillors and was invited to give a presentation to, on the idea to the South Central Area Committee. The experience of working with DCC and the NTA was night and day. While the councillors were extremely supportive, the reports back from the area engineers were utterly dismissive. And ironically, Bus Connects was proffered as the reason why none of my proposals could be adopted. After my presentation to the councillors went online, I became the subject of social her media harassment and trolling. One man living in Kildare said I should poison myself. Another man shouted at me in the street. A petition was started, hands off in Shakur, where people posted comments like the following. I live in an estate, it is safe. As for the main road, car accidents happen and children die, but that doesn't mean we should stop access to the road. It is the cost of doing business. It's a main road. People aren't going to come to Instacore just because it has safe cycling and nice places to eat outside. If we block it off for people passing through in their cars, those people will boycott Instacore businesses and people who use bikes are generally poor so won't be able to support businesses anyway. I was shaken by the experience, um, but I live with a toddler so I'm pretty used to being tortured and harassed on a daily basis. After about a week, I started reaching out to the less violent objectors. We talked on the phone, we went for walks, and I produced three options for people to vote on, taking into consideration the objections and comments. The majority of people once again voted for the most people-centered plan, and DCC once again refused to do anything to change the road layout, this time stating that because the road was a 50 kilometer per hour zone, nothing could be done to facilitate an outdoor summer, despite the funding and recommendations provided by central government. I'm aware I'm running out of time and I don't want to end on a down note. 
Um, my COVID mobility plan has found a life beyond the internet, and that is in the Kilmainham Inch Core Development Strategy, which reimagines the village as a pedestrian friendly place. I've written a lengthy critique of that strategy using the principles described at the beginning of this presentation on walkability, on feminism, and the deification of the, of the car on my website. I'll finish by saying that we need to change how we consult with the public on infrastructure. We have to end this practice of presenting aerial maps of routes with no options for people to consider. These are visions that frighten people and make them feel powerless. These renderings capture nothing about what they love about our communities. So of course they feel that progress on sustainable transport will destroy the city when it should be the savior of the city. No one experiences their neighborhood from the air. To imagine a really vibrant city, in my mind, it is more important to kneel, to get down on the ground and feel how dangerous, how polluted, how degraded our urban environment is for children. By deifying the car, we have made the death and injury and disempowerment of our children obscene, off stage. We have confined them to their bedrooms because their smartphones are more social than their streets. We have corralled them into playgrounds that are boring and juvenile and unsupervised and then act surprised when they vandalize those facilities. We treat people, especially young people, like their problems with all their wild and enormous potential. And we harass and silence people who have the temerity to share their vision. Dublin will be a great city again when a diverse array of people feel like they can participate in the life of the city. So if you're watching this and you're a mother or a poet or a painter, if you have the ability to look at a yellow box and see a flea market or a production of Oedipus Rex, please engage with these processes. Your experience is valuable and it is desperately needed if the city is to have a future. The Metro Southwest consultation is open until July 25th. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, brilliant presentation, I have to say. Um, Lauren, as far as I've known her, she has always uh, advocated for sustainable transport, but the, more recently, it's more how to push for uh, each village, and she has done so much for Inchicore. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, thank you to all our speakers. We're going to go into our Q&A session. We have quite a number of Q&As, so I'm going to, the Q&A session is scheduled for 20 minutes, so we're going to try to keep to time as much as possible. For those people I don't ask the questions of, um, please um, email us and we will try to get them answered. So and for so we'll kick off. Uh, Mike, Mike McKillen. Oh, I know Mike. Uh, how do we persuade citizens that we are in a climate crisis and that how we get around our city and suburba, suburbia has to change from now on? It's too easy for climate deniers to block progress when no one wants to leave the comforts of their car. I'm going to give that one to Brian. So, and then I'm going to go on to Christoph afterwards, right? Um, I, I think Lauren kind of uh, kind of encapsulated an answer to that very, very, um, very well. And uh, and uh, we have to bring everybody with us when we're doing this. And, and it's great to hear that process that happened around Bus Connects and Inchicore, but we do have to bring everybody with 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 them. And it is the carrot and stick, Mike, um, that, that that's required. We do need to put in the big public transport projects and then we need to, you know, we need to use road pricing, we need to use congestion to get people out of the cars. And we've seen that works, like say with the plastic bag levy, when you charge people for something, you can you can avert, you can change behavior. But behavior takes a long time to change. And these public transport projects also take a long time to, to, to bring in as well. So it's it's something that's going to happen over the next decade, even longer for it to, to really come to fruition. Okay, Christoph, the question is, was there significant opposition to these road changes in Paris? If so, how did you deal with it? And what lessons could Dublin take from this? Thinking of judicial processes, which has stalled some projects in Dublin, just to explain that a little, judicial processes are people who take on uh, court cases to stop a certain uh, uh, a certain infrastructure developments. A good example would be Sandy Mount cycle lane that's currently being halted at the moment. Deputy Lord Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor. Yes, when you have changes, you always have some resistances from people uh, who don't want uh, any change. Uh, but we have the support of the citizens. Uh, the measures were announced in our program and we were elected for that. So uh, we had also the support of the majority of people who wanted to have these changes. Uh, and it is also a plan uh, an, in an overall plan. So uh, in, with these measures uh, giving uh, 
back space uh, to pedestrians. We had also uh, uh, more uh, uh, bus lanes, also uh, more trains, more metros, uh, more public transportation, uh, also uh, giving the, the possibility to people to have shared mobility with bike sharing system and also car sharing systems. Uh, so this is an overall plan. And uh, uh, also these are progressive changes. Uh, what you saw uh, was a radical change in 2016, but it was uh, a 15 years uh, debate. Uh, so it started at the beginnings of the uh, 2000 uh, uh, years and uh, it, it lasted uh, 15 years before we had these radical uh, changes. And before that, we increased by 1 million uh, the number of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the offer uh, for the for the public transportation so it was a progressive change and then after that we could have this radical uh, measure okay thank you Christophe. lauren do you have any advice on how to approach all the consultations this is from claire i feel there are so many there's no feedback and i can feel like it's a wasted effort <laughs> sandy Mount is a good example oh claire sandy Mount is the bait of my life um how do you sustain the energy to keep engaging with these processes and are they all really necessary do our leaders just need to be braver and stop pandering to car owners um well i guess um I was thinking about what my own answer would have been to the last question about how to bring people along, um, which would be, you know, first of all, I'd ask, who are you asking? You know, are you asking residents associations that typically meet at 8 p.m. and that are run by, you know, retired people, generally men? Um, are we asking kids? Um, are, you know, are we asking mothers? I feel like, you know, when you have a child, this profound change happens in your life and you go from being, you know, someone who's able-bodied and unencumbered and able to get around Dublin pretty easily to all of a sudden having to move around with a buggy and like experiencing what it's like to have accessibility issues and um, to need ramps um, you know to need that that space on the bus um, so I think like asking women particularly mothers um, would be really helpful in terms of getting uptake on sustainable transport and um, yeah, so and then also asking people what they like about their neighborhoods it drives me nuts every time I go to one of these public consultation things. And no, it's just like, here's a presentation of what we're going to do. And now give me your response. There's no like getting to know people, getting to know what they like about their neighborhood and then saying, OK, we're going to build that. If you like living in Inchcore because you're near the Memorial Gardens, like how do we make the experience of walking to the Memorial Gardens feasible for you? Because it's not, you, you know, it's really hard to walk across Con Calvert Road with a buggy. Um, you know, it's terrifying. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's how I would do it by concentrating on building on the strengths and asking a more diverse group of people. Oh, and in terms of like how I keep the energy of doing this, <laughs> um, building a group and having allies because it's absolutely exhausting. But if you know, if you have an infrastructure around you, even if it's just a WhatsApp group of like 10 people, you know, who feel strongly about this, there'll be someone to take the baton on each public consultation. You know, you don't have to be the person who's coming up with the plan for um, the metro or the plan for bus connects. You know, you can share it out. Um, but you know, having a group of people will be really sustain you. Thank you, Lauren. The next one I have is Brian. Uh, Brian, do you think the proposal to terminate the metro at Charlemagne is a lost cause? Should dark underground also go ahead? From um, I, I think all of the big public transport projects should go ahead um, uh, around terminating at Charlemagne. Uh, that's what's happening. That's what's happening in the in Metro Link, and that's outside of the, the the consultation that's happening with the GDA and. What my other, I'm, I'm involved with the NTA on, on the, the new strategy for the city. So the, the options after Charlemagne are being looked at. Um, um, as somebody that lives along the green line, um, I would love it to come all the way out um, um, to my house, um, but it's it's something that's been looked at. Direct underground, yes, it, it, that should go ahead. The, the big problem I think see about public transport projects is there's a far too much higher burden of proof needed to justify building public transport. There wasn't this burden of proof required for the motorway network. A lot of the motorway network, especially say the, the, the motorway between Dublin and, uh, and Waterford, where I'm from, never reaches international standards for what you would build a motorway for. So public transport really has to wash its face and that the level of proof it has to get is so high in, in this country. 
Thank you, Brian. Uh, Christoph, I have three questions that's kind of similar, so I'm just going to lob them at you. It's all about car and Paris, which I'm also really keen on asking. Uh, Kristen, uh, Rob and Monica all have the question about, well, there is a strong car lobby here in Dublin uh, and there's a small minority of focal users of cars that dramatically delay progress. So presumably this was a problem for France, for Paris. How did yourselves what was the, the, the strategy to make sure there, that people accepted reduced public car parking provisions? And how did you manage the issue of making sure when you reduce spaces uh, and take the street car, uh, car parking spaces off that uh, citizens were convinced that this would be okay? Each city has its own history, of course, but we, we, we are all facing the same uh, uh, questions and we have all the same legacy about uh, uh, the dominance of, uh, of car-oriented uh, uh, cities. Um, we, we started uh, giving uh, more spaces to public transportation, to all the alternatives to the use of uh, the individual car. And it was a very progressive uh, policy and with very progressive results. Uh, one of, the res of these results were the fact that we had a drop of the use of motorized traffic by two, three or four percent uh, uh, every year. So we have the drop. So that means that less and less people are using the car and more and more people are using the public transport or um, shared mobility or, uh, or uh, 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 bikes. And then we had also a drop of the ownership of cars. So today we have just one third of the Parisians who own a car. So they don't want to have cars in the streets because they, they don't own a car. So if you, so, so that means that you, that you have to, to, to have also a policy about parking uh, spaces. Uh, and if you have more and more spaces for cars, then you will have more, more and more use of the cars. But if you have less and less space, uh, you will have uh, a, a, a smaller use and then you could, it will be also easier to have uh, uh, big changes also in reshaping the, the streets. So I would say that it's a progressive uh, policy and these results also were progressive. And then there is a, a, a tipping point. I don't know what is the moment of this tipping point. It depends of course on the, on the situation of the, of the country and the city, the culture of the people. But um, at, at one moment, you can have also the majority for uh, a support of having uh, more space for active mobility, more space for people, for citizens. And then uh, those who were against uh, any change uh, will be a, a minority. Uh, and then you can, you can manage the change uh, easily. Okay. But it's also a question of political will. Uh, you can also announce this measure in your program and once, if you are elected, just do uh, what you have to do. I, I like that last comment. So, uh, right, next one is for Lauren. Kieran Perry from Rot Minds Initiative here. I, I need to pretend to be Kieran's voice now. Uh, in Dublin, we have tended to focus very much on the big projects. Lewis, Metro, Bus Connects, Livy Cycle Route, et cetera, et cetera. And this can mean a lot of effort and work being put into projects that then, that then get delayed or canceled. We are less effective at doing the small things that could be could have very big impacts on a local scale. Example, removing traffic through widening footpaths, planting trees, protecting cycle lanes, etc. In Rot Mines, we found that it, we found it difficult to achieve these things because often the issue spans across several departments within the council and with other state or semi-state bodies, and it is left to local communities to try to navigate this fragmented structure and bring them together under a singular vision. Community groups can very quickly become frustrated by this institutional inertia. How can we improve our local government to harness the efforts of community groups to make these improvements? So Lauren, I'm direct directing that at you because you, you, you've you worked on the ground with community groups. You've been part of those, uh, the, uh, of the group, uh, groups driving the initiatives from the ground. And you've also worked from the other side as well in terms of uh, govern, uh, gov governing bodies. Like what is, uh, what do we need to uh, improve? across the board to harness uh, the efforts. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you, Kieran. It's a Gordian knot navigating all of these state agencies and groups. And, um, you know, I think 
and, and like I haven't achieved anything either like there's no new pedestrian crossings yet there's no new, you know there's no additional footpath space yet there, there are on plans and you know bus connects is starting but um I you know I think um what I've learned is that you know um don't write anyone off when it comes to your counsellors like absolutely you be as friendly and charming and persuasive as you can be even with the people that you think like oh well they're never gonna consider um, a bike lane um so you know if you can get all of your counsellors on board then I feel like they'll be advocating for you and they'll continue harassing the area manager and harassing the engineers and like they'll keep pushing um so I think yeah um you know as much as it, you know, it's really valuable, of course, to document your community support, but then to also like make sure that you're building that and, you know, that your councillors aren't suing the government over, um, you know, cycle paths. Um, <laughs> that would be my advice. I shouldn't laugh at that. I totally disagree with people suing over cycle paths. So, um, uh, yeah. So, Brian, um, is the best person to answer this, according to Peter. Uh, con con or, but it's open to everyone. Congestion charges are obviously coming down the tracks for motorists. But what about free public transport? Is that realistic or is it populist or is it both of that? Thanks. Uh, yeah, pu pu free public transport, anything is realistic. We can do anything. It just depends upon where we want to put our priorities. Um, uh, I've spoken about this before in Estonia that they, they've put out free public transport. Um, they basically made public transport a public good, and that's where it's funded through your taxes, and that's something that's that is possible. Um, yes, congestion charging is coming down the tracks, most likely, definitely in Dublin first, and probably in Cork at some point as well. Um, free public transport it's it's not really the cost that deters people from using public transport, it's the convenience. Um, and like when you model it and in like the probability models we use to, to estimate who was going to use what mode of transport cost is, is, is a very small factor it's convenience and uh and comfort there's they're the two big things because if cost was a factor when you look at the cost of driving a car you spend 20 30k on a car and then for every trip if you were to divide it out you know th that's the real cost of, of, of taking a car so cost isn't i don't think at least uh, on public transport the big factor Thanks, Brian. Um, Christoph, I have two here from Lurken and Sheila about greening. So you talk, you, your presentation talked about planting. So Lurken says, apart from the license to plant, is there a way for citizens in Paris to request other interventions on their street, such as a bike lane or pedestrianization? What happens if they object to these? How do you resolve the conflict? So it's back to the whole, uh, because Collins had asked, how do you gather public support in Paris against the naysayers? Because we talked about change management earlier on at the start of this conversation. How do you manage people's um, expectations, but how do you how, how do you plow on ahead? And um, Sheila would like you to talk about the greening of Paris a little bit, particularly around the landscaping around famous monuments. Uh, well, um, we we have public service also, uh, and that can help us to um, uh, to implement our our, our policy. And uh, uh, we have uh, also. Uh, uh, a lot of meetings uh, with uh, uh, the neighborhood of uh, of a sector where we are doing some uh, some works uh, to to reshape uh, the, the public space. So uh, all these uh, changes are made with the citizens and not against them. So uh, sometimes they can vote also uh, to uh, for an option. Uh, you can uh, give the possibility also to uh, uh, do you prefer. Uh, uh, that this street is pedestrianized or do you prefer that uh, uh, you will still uh, uh, get some traffic uh, with reduced speed, for example. So, and what uh, surprised me uh, uh, at all time is that when you ask the people, they always choose the more radical solution uh, to, <laughs> to go to, to the pedestrianization. So uh, you should also ask people about their uh, street, their, uh, their city, and their, their, their life, what they're also expecting, and you will never be uh, uh, disappointed by the results. Thank you. Um, are we, hang on, sorry, there's, um, 
Sheila wants to know, Brian, great to see Brian addressing the premium space given over to car parking in city centre, which could be used for more useful uh, uses, housing, urban gardens, community hubs. Are there initiatives to improve the permeability of Trinity cam Campus for active travel, particularly during nighttime? So, the, uh, so yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, car parks take up a huge amount of space, and, and it's not just the multi stories um, across uh, on our streets and roads. Uh, yeah, they take up a lot of space. They also generate an awful lot of money. Uh, in terms of the campus permeability at nighttime, I'm I'm not on, I, I'm not sure um, uh, what the plans are around that. I know over the recent years, Martina and Mullen, who's also on the call, would, would be able to, to speak more to this. But we have put in huge amounts of extra um, bike parking on the campus lanes across the campus as well to make it more permeable um, and I'm sure our new province has lots of great ideas uh, as, as, as how to get more people onto our, our, our beautiful campus. And just say, we will have a 24 hour open um, our, we have a new building on Pier Street that will mean that it, the campus will be open 24 hours um, so at the moment it is totally permeable anybody's allowed onto it at any time under normal circumstances up until 10 p.m but just for security reasons it's closed from 10 p.m on, 10 PM on but there is going to be a 24 hour opening from probably December 2021. Okay, thank you, Martina. I'm conscious we're at six now, so I'm just gonna ask uh, two more questions, a few more questions. Uh, firstly, Lauren, um, I've realized I went back to Brian instead of you, so sorry about that. Claire says, not a question, but well done, Lauren. We need more people <laughs> like you. Absolutely, she is right. Uh, the second one is from Janet asking, to what extent do you think that a directly elected Lord Mayor would uh, help accelerate a more livable city for Dublin? I'm gonna ask you this, and I'm gonna move over to Christoph to answer the same, and Brian as well. Um, yeah, that, yeah, um, I, I'd, I'd like to think that's a quick win. Um, I'm always nervous about saying things would be a quick win, but you know, we, we are in a, we, there's a by-election happening right now where the livable city has become like the, the issue that's going to decide it. And, you know, vote for people who have a track record of advocating for walking and cycling and public transport and who aren't speaking out of both sides of their mouth on the issue. That's what I would say. Okay, thank you. Christoph, your position as Deputy Mayor of Paris, it's a position that has that executive function as well, executive function. So do you think a directly elected mayor is, is what Dublin needs? Um, I, don't, I don't know, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the situation about Dublin, but <laughs> I, can, I can tell you something about uh, what I think about what is a livable city, uh, especially in, uh, uh, using uh, the public space. Uh, I would say that if you have a city uh, where you have families uh, driving uh, with their children on bike lanes, and then you have a livable city. That means a city for all people, uh, for all ages. Uh, and I would say that uh, uh, you will have achieved your goal uh, also as public uh, 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 decision maker. I don't know. I'm sorry if, if it's an answer to your question, but uh, I would I, I would I wanted just to to conclude that about yeah. what uh, is a, a livable city. To, to be honest with you, I think the fact that your presentation and what you gave to it has kind of answered that question in relation to a directly elected mayor, because the powers that have, you have in relation to executive function is something we don't have here as councillors and as the Lord Mayor. And that's what's sorely missing in relation to directing certain projects in the city to make sure that we have sustainable transport. Brian, what do you think of that? Definitely, we definitely need a directly elected mayor in, in Dublin um, and the mayor should have um, budget over transport um, completely and he or she can then champion these big projects um, like the metro or the small projects that Kieran spoke about. Um, I, I, somebody that has a vision for this city that's purely for, for, for Dublin and, and Dublin is such a fantastic um, um, city that we were also lucky to live in. But I do think a, a single voice, um, someone that we can, we can follow um, I, I just think it will be a great, a great asset to the city. And we'll see how it works in Limerick. And they're about to directly elect their mayor and we'll see what happens down there. And I think almost like the Greenways, every city in the country is gonna want one um, uh, when we see the success, I hope, uh, in, in Limerick. Yeah, I think that's what myself and the other three mayors were talking about. 
um, that way to see the, the model in Limerick. We are over time, so this is the last question that was directed to all, all three of yourselves. How do we better approach or deal with objectors to sustainable mobility schemes? Example, the third, uh, the final third of locals not supportive of Paris redevelopment, people alleging Brian's anti-carism or people trolling the inchy course scheme. So Brian, I start off with you again first. You bring people with you, um, and that's that's what you do. If anybody wants to see, and Lauren's doing great work in Inchicore, but if you look at, or if you listen to the story that happened up in Westport when they were building the the, the greenway up in Westport, basically the the architect for the town and all of the engineers and planners brought everybody with them. It's not a it's not a battle between people. You need to bring people with you. You need to demonstrate what you're doing is working as well. And I think once the first bus connects routes go in you'll see the benefits of them and, and that will bring people with them. So it becomes illogical to take a car and that then you go for the, the non-car option always. Thank you, Brian. Lauren? Yeah, I think there's a really good example in TU Dublin where I'm currently studying. Um, so that campus was, uh, you know, up until recently was, um, you know, an asylum and people in the locality were, were quite nervous about opening it up and, it, you know, taking on this new space. And how they approached it was by building the playground first. Um, you know, they put a playground in and they, they opened up the permeability and they gave certain, you know, stakeholders in the community access to the playground. And, you know, people began to say, oh, well, you know, this actually works. And now how do I get, how do I get a key um, in? And, you know, just saw that like the playground became a real focal point of the community. And, um, you know, I get like, I, I'm just, I, I won't shut up about the whole, just, you know, getting the kids and getting the parents and getting the young people and the people who, you know, we're gonna have to deal with these changes, you know, who are gonna, you know, they're the people, you know, I think whose voices aren't being heard and should have a, a you know, a stronger voice in these processes. Um, and then, you know, hopefully that will balance um, the objectors. And then, you know, I think if you're someone like uh, something that I think that I'm doing that's valuable is I've kind of become a punching bag so or a lightning rod for opposition. So people can kind of harass me about it, but then they won't be harassing counselors. So if you're someone who feels like kind of taking on that role, I think it's really valuable. And like, yeah, it's a bit scary in the beginning, but then you kind of um, you, you get over it and you, you grow a thick skin. Thanks, Lauren. Your counselors are there for you to harass, so don't don't just harass Lauren. You can all you can all come and harass the rest of us. Uh, Christoph, tell us how. Like you talked about the final third of locals not supportive, and you talked about how once the decision is made, you plow ahead with it. Like, what is that the best approach, or is there advice on what's the best approach that we can do here? Well, we, the best approach is, is with, uh, to, to, to make the decisions with citizens uh, and also to, um, to realize also uh, their expectations. And what I see with the pandemic is that uh, more and more people uh, want to have livable cities uh, in which you can just uh, uh, breathe, uh, do some sport, uh, have... Uh, also a space for the children. And especially I would, I would talk about the children because uh, our cities weren't shaped for children for decades and decades. They were uh, reshaped uh, for a motorized traffic and not for children. So if you get people on the streets, if you have children on the streets, then I think that you uh, can uh, say that you have a more livable city and that that is uh, what I, I think is the better thing uh, we can uh, hope for the future. Thank you. That's a good note to end on, folks. Sorry, I didn't get to ask everyone's questions. There was quite a lot of them. Uh, we tried to answer as many as possible. And for anyone who wants to continue to ask their question directed at any particular uh, speaker, so Christoph, Lauren, or Brian, please send your uh, questions into health dot promotion at tcd.ie that's health dot promotion at tcd.ie and it, the question will be directed to the relevant speaker then uh, thank you so much uh, uh, to my panelists uh, Christoph, Lauren, Brian, and thank you so much to the audience, but particularly thank you for Trinity, uh, to Martina and uh, uh, Alex for um, sorting this out and for hosting this great uh, um, discussion on the topic of the future of Dublin and how it should be. Thanks a million, everyone. See you again. <laughs>